For our second presentation this evening, we will be hearing about a Franciscan, Mother Marianne Cope. And so we have invited a Franciscan to do the presentation. We have with us Loreen Payne, who is a member of the Secular Franciscan Order. Loreen uh, received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1974 at the University of Michigan. For the next 10 or 12 years, she had a number of medical management positions, taught briefly at Pikes Peak Community College in Colorado Springs, and then began graduate work in special education and biology at the University of Col uh, Colorado. For four years, she engaged in home care nursing, and then in 1999, in uh, the Houston area, began teaching in Kingwood College, where she was active in restructuring the curriculum. In 2002, she received her Master of Science in Nursing, where her thesis was Predicators of Success in Vocational Nursing Programs. Uh, also in 2002, she began teaching in what is now uh, Lone Star College and also at Tomball College, where she engaged both in classroom instruction and clinical supervision. During this period also, she worked as a volunteer nurse, providing free medical uh, care at a clinic for indigent people. And then two years ago, received her doctorate in education curriculum and instruction from the University of Houston. Her doctoral dissertation was on mitigating low health literacy. For the last three years, um, Lorene has been an oncology nurse working for the University of Texas Arlington, but working at MD Anderson Cancer Center. There, as a senior nursing instructor, she provides clinical education to assigned inpatient and outpatient oncology units. She's a reviewer for Mosby Press on uh, nursing textbooks, has co-authored an NCLEX preparation manual, and has written a textbook published last year for student nurses entitled The Nursing Student's Guide to Clinical Success. She has received awards for her work in disaster preparedness, uh, also a Teaching Excellence Award, She's married, she has four children, and she began to feel the call to a vocation about eight years ago. She says that she prayerfully checked the secular orders of Carmelites, Dominicans, and Franciscans, but she felt most at home with the Franciscans, the recognition of God in everything, the simple joy, the call for humility and poverty. So she entered formation in 2003, entered the novitiate in 2006, and then made holy profession in 2007. She is also currently head of the St. Thomas More Secular Franciscan Fraternity here in Houston. Lorene Payne. privilege of sharing with you tonight Blessed Mother Mary Ann Pope. What a wonderful example of an American on a journey to sainthood Blessed Mother Mary Ann is. But I wanted to share with you before we got into her story a quote from her which indicates she would be a little bit disproving of us discussing her tonight. <laughs> if you read with me, what little good we do to help and comfort the suffering. We wish to do it quietly and so far as possible, unnoticed and unknown. Isn't that just so exemplary of the Franciscan spirituality and of so many of the great saints through history? They served, they worked for God with his people, uh, not for their own glory, but to be present for him. Yet we stand here tonight and we're going to talk a lot about her. More for us than for her. What an inspiration. 
This has been a wonderful Lenten series. I thank Dr. Hahn and the University of St. Thomas for putting it on. Because every Wednesday through this <coughs> glorious preparatory season, we've been reminded of the beauty of the lives of these wonderful people. And I would invite you as you listen to Marianne Pope's story to think about how you can do similar things on the scale that you're allowed in your own world. You always have to start off with the early years. She was not Blessed Mother Mary Ann Cope when she was born. <laughs> she was born Barbara Kube, actually, and born in Germany in 1838. But when she was about a year old, her parents moved to New York. Uh, through the years, they became American citizens, and as many of that generation, their name was Americanized to Cope. Barbara felt called to a vocation very early in life, but as with many Catholic families, hers was very large. She was one of the eldest, and her family needed her money, so she worked in the factory, contributing to the family's uh, needs, and did not get to enter uh, and begin her own studies and profession until uh, the children were grown. So she was 24 when she joined the Sisters of St. Francis. Her name that she took was Mariana. It was later changed or kind of shortened to Marianne. Her first assignments as a sister were for teaching. And she did very well at her teaching and in fact showed quite a bit of leadership abilities. So when the sisters needed an administrator for their hospital later, um, St. Joseph Hospital there in New York, they tapped into her skills, and these became really important um, values and, and abilities that she cultivated in herself through this early work as a sister of St. Francis that she was going to need later in what became her life's mission. It started in 1883. Mother Mary Ann was 45 years old by then. And the Kingdom of Hawaii had sent out letters to numerous different religious orders begging and pleading for religious to come to Hawaii and take care of the lepers that they had isolated in a little leper colony. Of the entire 50 different orders that were asked, only Mother Mary Ann responded with yes. But of course, you couldn't just say, yes, I'll go and go, because as a member of a religious order, you don't decide everything on your own. Your uh, leadership must approve that. And you can see from one of the quotes that she wrote in her letter early that she really prayed that the Father Provincial would let them go. She wanted to go do the work, in her words, in the name of the great St. Francis. And she was allowed to go. But I want to stop for a minute to just mention leprosy itself. We don't see it here. Leprosy is a disease that thankfully is now treated and treatable. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 37 years and never saw a case. Around the world you can still find leprosy, but uh, it is treatable. Not in her day, though. And it was very important to her, you saw in that quote, she wanted to go work with the lepers in the name of the great St. Francis. Leprosy has biblical and Franciscan significance. We're all familiar with the story of Jesus healing the leper. In fact, it was a recent gospel reading at Mass. So there's a Catholic significance to the lepers. There's also a Franciscan significance to lepers, and Blessed Mother Mary Ann would have known that. Our founding father, St. Francis, had an abhorrence to lepers. When he was being called by Christ and learning what his vocation was going to be, uh, it was a real milestone for him the day that he actually got off his horse and instead of running away from where the lepers were, he went to the leper and not only uh, embraced him but kissed him. This was the beginning of his recognition that we must see God in everyone and everything. And that so permeates the Franciscan charism. And Blessed Mother Mary Ann wanted to follow that example. She wanted to work with the lepers. I'll share a little bit about what leprosy is. It is a disease caused by a bacterium we know now. Uh, 
They did not know that, of course, in Mary Ann's time. The bacteria lives mostly in the skin, and as it grows and colonizes and develops, it causes grotesque changes in appearance. Uh, the collage in the bottom corner of the picture are all kinds of pictures, actually, of the Hawaiians that were there when, uh, Mary, in Mary Ann's time. This is what leprosy did to people. It made them look quite horrific in the later ages. There was not treatment for it until the 1940s. And we're talking about the late 1800s. In fact, there wasn't treatment in Jesus' time, there wasn't treatment in Francis' time, and there wasn't treatment in Mary Ann's time. The only thing that people knew was that if you got leprosy, you were destined to become disfigured. There was no cure. You would probably lose uh, ears, nose, parts of people fell off. Uh, and, uh, and it was contagious, that much they knew. So what did they do? They isolated. It was thought that the Chinese brought leprosy to Hawaii, and it spread uh, quite fast. At that point, Hawaii was a kingdom, actually. It wasn't a state. It was a, a kingdom, and King Kamehameha V recognized that if he didn't isolate the lepers, that the, the disease would spread. Uh, so he determined an isolation law. Let me show you just a minute this little point of a work, yes. Can you all see over here? This picture at the bottom repre uh, represents all of the, what we now call the Hawaiian Islands. At that point, they were part of the Sandwich Islands. Um, and the one, the small one in the center is uh, Molokai. And it is represented up by itself here in larger scale. And you can see that on the island of Molokai, there's a small peninsula here jutting out. That's Palawapapa Peninsula. And it was at that peninsula that, that King Kamehameha decided he would isolate the lepers because it gave a natural isolation in its configuration. A peninsula, three sides, ocean. And the land side was a huge natural cliff. You can see it in this picture here. You know those cliffs going up? They're like 3,000 feet. No one who was dropped in that a uh, piece of land was going to escape. So the Sisters of St. Francis received permission to go and work in the kingdom with the lepers. They arrived in October 22nd, 1883, and Mother Mary Ann brought six sisters with her. They were first set up at, um, on the island of Maui, where the kingdom had set up a receiving station. And this receiving station was intended to, uh, anyone who was expected of leprosy was sent there first. And the sisters would tend to them and evaluate them. And from there, they would go to the isolation on Malachi. So when you hear this receiving station, you kind of picture a, you know, a little physical uh, building that people would go to and the sisters would greet them nicely. But this is late 18. Uh, 80s. They didn't have nice facilities. It was a mess. In fact, we know because one of the sisters kept a diary. And this is her description of the conditions when they arrived. The building was intended to house 100 people. When the sisters got there, there were 200 people. And as you read these words, they paint a very grim picture, don't they? Bed bugs, lice, filthy straw, dirtiness, uh, men, women, and children of all different uh, phases and stages of leprosy all clumped together. It kind of sounds like a disaster scene, doesn't it? And if you talk to anyone who's worked in disaster, one of the things that really stays in the mind and in the memory is the smell of a disaster. And Sister Leopoldina's diary continues and gets to that smell. It was just an overwhelming stench. These bacteria are living in the skin, rotting and decaying the skin, and it's warm in Hawaii, and I mean, it's just, it was awful conditions. <laughs> Try to picture yourself going into this. You came here to help people, and it is, it is miserable. 
So what did the sisters do? Did they scream and run away? I didn't ask for this. This is too hard. Heavens no. They loved, and they gave, and they served. What a story, huh? She used all of her skills of administration, all of the strength she had from God, and really cleaned up the place. Within two years, the king was pinning a medal on her. Uh, but what's more important, I think, is that obviously, again, they weren't doing it to get a medal. They weren't doing it to get a recognition. Uh, this is the way that, that the sisters uh, describe what they did. For us, it is happiness to be able to comfort, in a measure, the poor exiles. And we rejoice that we are unworthy agents of our Heavenly Father, through whom he deigns to show his great love and mercy to the sufferers. Oh, what beauty of soul is that? In 1988, after they had served there for five years, the receiving station was closed. And Mother Mary Ann and her sisters <coughs> moved to Molokai to where the actual exiles were kept. So were the conditions better there? <laughs> what do you think? Let's think. We had, a, by then, a thousand people living on Molokai. Now remember, these were people who were forcibly exiled to the peninsula. In fact, in the early days of this isolation law, it was, it was horrible how people were sent off. Uh, they would be taken in boats just off the shore and thrown in the water and told to swim for it. And that was, that was all they had. They would sometimes throw supplies out and hope that the currents took them to shore. Uh, really, really sad. So you had a thousand people made to be exiled. Was there a cure coming around the corner? No. They knew that their fate was to get worse and worse with this disease and finally die. So uh, they weren't behaving very well. <laughs> they were lawless. The men stayed on the women. There was a lot of despair. There was no feeling of hope in this uh, environment. But again, the sisters rolled up their sleeves and did what was needed with God's grace to help these people. St. Francis is widely quoted, and you've probably heard his saying, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. And this was kind of the way that the sisters lived their lives, was showing through what they did for the least of our brothers, uh, the love to God. What did they do? Some very practical things. They opened a home to keep the, the women and the girls safe. They taught religion, they taught morals, they taught respect and cleanliness they required, just as they had on the receiving station. By the way, when um, Blessed Mother Mary Ann accepted the position with the lepers uh, in Molokai, she promised that neither she nor any of her sisters who served there would ever contract leprosy, and they never did. She was 80 when she died there, but not of leprosy. Not of them, Cleanliness was one of them. She also brought joy and fun. How Franciscan is that? <laughs> One thing about Francis that really appeals to me is uh, just the exuberant joy. God is with us. He is everywhere. And when you recognize that presence and you bring it into your daily world, even in the midst of this challenge of this leprosy disease, you can find and recognize the joy and look for the fun. And she shared it with them. Uh, Something that surprised me as I was researching for this is Robert Louis Stevenson visited Molokai one day. Evidently, outsiders were allowed to come in for brief visits, and he must have heard about it. He was so moved with what he saw there that uh, he wrote a poem that I'll share with you towards the end of this presentation. But he also sent a piano, and the accounts of the bishop's house always talk about uh, the music fun that was coming out. Other things the Sisters of St. Francis did, uh, they began gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, flowers, they landscaped, they made the environment reflect the beauty of God's world to us. They taught the women how to sew, and they didn't just do it with drab things, they wanted bright colors and scarves and pretty dresses. And as I said, 
Mother Mary Ann worked there until she was 80 years old. This is the St. Francis Church, which is on Molokai. Um, many of you may have heard of Father Damien. He was a Belgian priest who worked with uh, the boys on, the, on Molokai. He spent about 15 years there and he, until he died of leprosy. Um, Mother Marianne and the sisters took care of him in his final days and promised him they would watch after the boys when he was gone. This is Father Damien. I don't know how well you can see it, but that's him uh, and one of the sisters of St. Francis Carey. So it was 1918 when Mother Marianne died. She had kidney and heart failure disease. This picture um, is of Mother Marianne just a few days before she died, confined to a wheelchair, but still part of, part of all of it. So we've been, that's the story basically of what went on for her through her life and her life of service. And we've been spending each Wednesday looking at the path to sainthood. As we were told in the first lecture of this series, there are three steps. Uh, the first, <coughs> first must be venerable, then blessed until and before there is saint. So where is Mother Mary Ann in this process? Uh, she was already declared venerable. And as has been said, to be declared venerable, the deceased person must be recognized as having lived a life of heroic work. And that recognition must be granted by the Vatican. So all of the life's work of the person under consideration is compiled, <coughs> sent to the Vatican, to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, and in 1983, uh, the Vatican accepted that, re um, that compilation of work, that report, and Mother Mary Ann was named venerable as of that date. The second step to sainthood is the beatification. Um, in order to reach this step, the person must have been recognized as creating a miracle through their intercession. And what happened for Mother Mary Ann is this woman in the bottom corner here named Kate Mahoney. When Kate was a teenager, she contracted cancer. Uh, the cancer was treated and she was cured of the cancer, but through the process of her care, uh, her systems started shutting down. In medical jargon, we call that multi-system organ failure. And it is a threat to life, as, as that name should probably imply to you. Uh, Kate was close to death and expected to die when she was 14 years old. Uh, the people around her prayed for Mother Mary Ann's intercession. And as you can see, Kate is a young woman now. She was saved. Uh, and the miracle of her coming back from the, from the edge of death with this multi-system organ failure was attributed to Mother Mary Ann was recognized to her intercession and accepted by the Vatican. So she was beatified. By the way, this is our, of course, our Pope Benedict. And when Mother Mary Ann's miracle was accepted, when her beatification rite was done, it was the first beatification rite that this new German pontiff was uh, overseeing. And of course, Mother Mary Ann was born in Germany, so it was kind of a, an interesting connection. Another thing I learned is when someone is uh, beatified, the church expects that their remains will be uh, put in a shrine. And so when Mother Marianne died on Malachi, they just buried her there. And what was done for, for her at this step was her remains were uh, retrieved. And they were retrieved by um, volunteers from the military. The military does, of course, go around the world reclaiming the remains of servicemen. They have um, forensic specialists and pathologists and people who are good with bones to verify the remains, and they bring them back to the United States. Well, these, a couple of them were <coughs> solid Catholics, and when they heard of this, they wanted to be part of the gathering the remains, which they did. It was take, the remains were taken to uh, the Mother House in New York, uh, where you can see a shrine and museum and reliquary was set up. When next in New York, you can visit. 
Sainthood is the final step in the Blessed Mother Mary Ann, as I'm calling her blessed, if you know that she has not made that step yet. A second miracle must occur, be attributed to her, verified by the Vatican, and accepted for her to be recognized uh, as a saint. And her official website is seeking uh, input from people uh, looking for this second miracle. Just to tie up a couple of loose ends, um, I mentioned to you that the Molokai was in the Kingdom of Hawaii, which you now know at this point is the state of Hawaii. That law that was enacted by King Kamehameha was in effect until 1969. They did not repeal the Leprosy Isolation Act until 1969, but it was finally repealed. This is an aerial photo shot in 2004 of the compound of the former leper colony. And it now, as of 1980, was deemed uh, a state park. Actually, I guess a national historic park. Um, and this is just another picture of Molokai I thought was quite graphic for seeing how effectively the geography of that peninsula really isolated people. Um, that is the peninsula jutting out, and those are the formidable cliffs that kept everybody so effectively isolated. As we mentioned, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a poem after visiting the Sisters of St. Francis. Up here in the corner is a copy of his own handwriting. His picture is in, set in it. And uh, I'd like to just read it to you now. It really recognizes the value of what they were doing. To see the infinite pity of this place, the mangled limb, the devastated face, the innocent sufferer smiling at the rod, a fool were tempted to deny his God. He sees and shrinks, but if he looks again, lo, beauty springing from the breast of pain. He marks the sisters on the painful shore, and even a fool is silent and adores. So Robert Louis Stevenson was moved enough to recognize the value of Mother Mary Ann's life. I hope all of you have been touched by it some. And I'd like to invite you to pray with me, if you would, at this last prayer. Um, it's the prayer of St. Francis, the peace prayer of St. Francis. He probably didn't write that one, but it so beautifully expresses the Franciscan charism that we attribute it. We call it ours anyway, OK? <laughs> And I, I think that Mother Mary Ann's life is a tribute to the words of that prayer. And as you recite them with me, if you would, um, just reflect how she, how she lived that and how we might be also moved in parallel in our own worlds in some way uh, to do a bit of the good that she did. Lord, Lord may we shall